welcome back to my channel quest for faith with brian and here on this channel we try and break down the catholic faith from a newcomer's perspective so i came across this article 10 great uh the 10 great consequences of the protestant reformation and i kind of found it humorous um because the things that this article is trying to take credit for the the saying the reformation was takes credit for a lot of it's ridiculous there are a few things in there i like but i'm going to kind of go over a few of those and uh point out kind of what i learned when because honestly like reading through these initially my first thought was i totally before i was catholic i completely believed all this stuff so um but there's always two sides to every story. So so one of the first things you, that they listed out in this article is that the Protestant Reformation relocated spiritual and theological authority to Scripture. And this is where that sola scriptura thing comes in. But one of the things that they really did with this is taking away the church authority. And the church, what it, what it did a lot of times was set up these guardrails, right? Um it's set up um, what you, you know, there's some verses that the church is really explicit on. This is what this means. And there's others where it's kind of up to there's there's room for debate. Um, but it was always this nice little guardrail that you could work within. Um, but I don't even think this is necessarily true because, yeah, even though they were like, yeah, we scripture is the ultimate authority. But people like John Calvin were no i'm actually the ultimate authority and if you disagree with me um sorry uh i'm gonna try and get you executed and he tried to do that with somebody that one of his um underlings i'm gonna call them <laughs> uh was preaching in uh switzerland and this guy after that he was done was like hey i disagree with you i think that scripture means this and john calvin essentially basically arrested the dude and tried to get him executed because he disagreed with his interpretation of scripture. But what this ended up leading into was what we have today with so many different denominations um, that I don't even think you can count them at this point. Like we've heard the numbers of 40,000 to 30 to 20. Um, and I've had Protestants um, fire back at me when I've said the 40,000 comment before, like that was an inflated number. And to me, I'm like, not really, because if you count the number of Bible and non-denominational churches, it's insane. So, um, but I mean, you even have Martin Luther writing a letter to um, uh, Antwerp and just basically talking about how there's, a, there's as many Christian sects as there are heads because everybody has their own theology. And he's writing there because... There was just a peasant revolt against some nobility that were being led by a few men um, that were using scripture for justifications for these uh, for these revolts. Um, and it's just kind of nuts. But so, yeah, they tried to do that. But what ended up happening is just chaos. So I don't know how that's a great consequence for it. The Protestant Reformation challenged how persons gains right standing with God. And it challenged it by essentially, I'm going to uh, take the two, uh, the next two, the Protestant Reformation made liturgy and church services accessible to lay people. But what they did is they removed all the sacraments. And the church has always taught that the sacraments are how we draw closer to God. So going to confession, confessing our sins, doing penance for those sins, the Holy Eucharist with the real presence. I mean, you can't get, it, I mean, until we get to heaven, that's as close as we're ever going to get to God. Um, the priesthood, the sacrament of marriage, all of these different things. Um, they wiped them out. And to say that it gained right standing with God, and they're obviously talking obviously here with faith alone, that what your works don't, don't matter. But that is such a common misperception that Catholics think that you're saved by your works. We're saved by the grace of God. We're not even saved by our faith. It is our faith. We have to have our faith, but it's God. 
It's Jesus Christ dying on the cross that opened the gates of heaven. And by our baptism, joining the family of God uh, through baptism, receiving the Holy Spirit, through our faith, we show our works. Right. And so it's not faith alone. And it's not works alone. It's both. Because as a Catholic, we believe that um, the sacraments draw us closer to God. They help us uh, in our sanctification process and becoming more holy, hopefully, where we should be working on that. Um, and also, when, when our faith is strong and we're becoming more sanctified and we're walking on our journey with Christ, the things we do reflect our faith and those are our works. And there's countless scriptures in there that's talking about um, we'll be rewarded in heaven for the things we do or the, your, your treasures are stored in heaven. You, you know, so uh, both of these are just kind of ridiculous because essentially what they did is they said, your works don't matter. It's only your faith. So it doesn't matter what you do. Um, now, now Luther did say that you needed to live a decent life, but now that's up to interpretation because it's each his own man. Right. And then making it more accessible the, for lay people, it's like, yeah, you got rid of all the sacraments. You got rid of all the things that were helping you on your sanctification journey. Um, and then, so we're going to jump down a little bit, and I'll go back up to that. The Protestant... Yeah, uh, okay, hold up. Protestant Reformation for Women in Leadership, yeah. This one cracked me up. The Protestant Reformation made the Bible accessible to lay people. <sighs> no, it didn't. It did not. Okay. It is clearly in the historical record that Martin Luther's Lutheran Bible was not the first German Bible printed. Before he even started writing his, the Catholic Church had already approved and authorized. Um, I, I believe it was Czech, German, French. There's like two or three others had already been printed and translated into a common tongue. This was already happening. And then to lay claim that it was only because of the Reformation is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, that's just not the case at all. Now, the Vulgate was still the, the gold standard uh, for the Bible, but the church had already been authorizing re, um, the printing. It was the, the invention of the printing press. Are you kidding? And before this, what, what a lot of what I didn't understand as a Protestant, and what I think most Protestants don't understand, is how expensive Bibles were before the printing press. They were extraordinarily expensive. A single bible before the printing press would cost roughly three years salary for the average person in medieval europe three years so only the uber wealthy and the churches that when the church would make those yeah they would chain them to the, to the altar so they would not get stolen because they were literally worth the fortune because they had to be handwritten and painstakingly developed. And I think it took like up to 300 sheep because it was made with leather pages um, to create one Bible. It was insane the process that you had to go through to create a Bible before the printing press. And this one, the next one goes along with this, but the Protestant Reformation helped propel the spread of, of literacy across the continent. At least they said help. But there's a problem here. Because this was already happening. There was already massive focus for education and further developing the mind. We're right smack dab in the middle of the Renaissance era for, uh, for love of Pete. I mean, 
the Renaissance is already in full swing. There's universities that have already been founded 500 years before this to improve people's educational lives, right? Um, there was, and, and for instance, just for a great, a, a great uh, reference to this, Cardinal, Cardinal Cisneros, uh, the Archbishop of Plato in, uh, in Spain, this is in 1490 when he founded the University of uh, Alcala University. He created a Bible that was called the Plagot Bible, and it was in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. And he created dictionaries to go along with that be so priests could actually be more educated and learn Latin, Greek, and Hebrew and have dictionaries to be able to read scripture and interpret it correctly. That was already happening. And then he even bought a printing press and started printing books. And he published the books like Life of Christ and the, uh, uh, the Life of the Saints. And the, these books that he created influenced others. Like Ignatius of Loyola read, uh, I think actually those two books, when he was laid up in bed recovering from wounds, and it prompted him to found the Jesuits and spread the gospel throughout the world. Uh, St. Teresa of Avalon read, I think, The Life of Christ, which was published from uh, the printing press from Cardinal Cisneros. And that she credits that for her second conversion to find uh, to found 17 Carmelite uh, convents. So this idea that it was just because of the Protestant Reformation that literacy and education was was now a focus is just crazy. It just wasn't just that. I'm not going to say that they didn't have anything to do with it, but that was already happening. It's like they jumped on the train and said that, oh, this is our train now. That's not what happened. The train was already going and they just delegated themselves to their own cart and decided not to leave that cart if you think of the train as the catholic church but anyways and then they detached from it but I'll, I'll i'll go on from there um so this next one that i that i want to point out here um the protestant reformation configured reconfigured the church state relationship away from christendom <sighs> That's 100% accurate. It is because of the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther why this happened. But it wasn't a good thing. And I'll tell you why. So in before the Reformation, how society worked, um, the church was so good at being involved in people's day-to-day -day lives that when people would die, a lot of them would start donating their lands to the church. And are to monasteries. And then these monasteries and convents would grow and grow and grow because more and more people would start donating the, the land. And then the, the local uh, peasants would work that land and all the commerce would happen within the monastery. And so there was uh, masses amounts of land that the church was responsible for in all these different countries because they had been donated by, by, uh, by people. And that is really how the economy worked worked up until the the protestant reformation so in in august of 1520 luther writes this letter to the christian nobility of germany and basically starts pulling in this is when the nationalist card he starts playing and when he first starts calling catholics romanist right so it's these italians these romanists and we germans should be in charge of our own land and our own decisions. And this basically set off the greed alarms with all the, the nobility in, in Germany. And they're like, wait, so if I go with Luther and leave the Catholic church, I can just go plunder these lands. And then I'm super rich because now I got hundreds of thousands of acres that weren't mine before, but now they are. And I can reap the benefits of that. And I mean, you look at England, that's exactly what happened when Henry VIII ended up um, forming the Church, Church of England. That's what he did. He sacked the, all the monasteries, kicked out anyone that wouldn't convert or killed them. And overnight, within a year or two, was absolutely like the economy completely was devastated because they took that away. 
And so now, instead of the local convent or the local monastery being in charge and involved in the lives of the people around them, just a void opened up and all of these monasteries and convents were shut down and whoever wouldn't convert was, was either arrested, executed, what have you, or they fled. And that is how they rearranged the relationship between church and state and pulled it away from Christianity. That was the consequence of it. It was starvation and economic collapse for most places in Europe and war. So yeah, that's a great consequence. Now, the two things that I will say um, were positive consequences of the Protestant Reformation. There's two. One, the Protestant Reformation, um, where is it? Okay, I want to read it exactly. The Protestant Reformation firm, God's through mediation. Yeah, getting rid of the saints. I'm not even going to talk about that because that's just ridiculous. Uh, the Protestant Reformation exposed profound corruption in church leadership. They didn't expose it. They just made the church deal with it faster. And I say that because there was this, another Augustinian monk who was a bishop, uh, 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 Gales of Ver Verturbo, in 1512. He, he called on Rome, went to Rome with a bunch of bishops and the Pope and said, hey, we need a reformation. So let's think about this, right? We already have um, Cis Cardinal Cisneros in 1490, and then we have Gales of Vir Viterbo. Both of these men calling for change and doing things about it. And Gales of uh, Viterbo, he's he was the first one to say, "Hey, we need a reformation. We need a new springtime." And he that's what he was calling for, and and to fix these issues that that they were seeing. Because even the uh, bishopship for uh, Cardinal Cisneros, when he got appointed bishop, the nobles or kings and queens could have a say. Like they didn't get to completely pick their bishop, but they could say, hey, I want one of these two guys. And then the church would pick between them. And even for that bishopship, there was people within the uh, Spanish royalty's family that was like, hey, I want to keep this in the family because of how much influence that a monastery or a parish would have uh, if you were the, the the bishop of an area and over a, a, a number of monasteries. They want to keep it in the family, keep the power and influence they can get. And by the grace of God, Queen Is uh, Isabel I um, said no, because somebody was trying to get an eight-year-old to be appointed bishop so that the family could keep control over those lands. And she said, no, we're going to pick somebody who's actually qualified to be a bishop. And that's how Cisneros got his spot. But one of the other things where, um, so yeah, did the Protestant Reformation call out corruption? I think, yeah, but it wasn't like it was it wasn't like it was, it was an unknown thing. And everybody was like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. I have not noticed this. This was already a discussion. That's what it is. And the, the 10th and final thing that they point out is that it, it, uh, uh, the Protestant reformation, let me scroll down here. A Protestant reformation caused the Roman church to ignite its own reform. It didn't cause it. It accelerated it from what I've already pointed out with what already was happening. It probably would have taken a hundred years or maybe longer because really it's hard to, you have to change people, right? You can't just uh, put laws in place or change doc or not doctrine. You know what I mean? Canon law and all that kind of stuff and how things operate. You have to change people. And the Protestant reformation accelerated this process. And so when you get the council of Trent, it comes in and it, basically lays it down to fix all the abuses that were actually happening with uh, the greediness coming in from, from royalty trying to get bishopships and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'll give it that. So anyways, I, I, I was just laughing at this article because there's a lot of just funny things in there, but um, yeah, the Protestant reformation wasn't cut as all cut out as I grew up thinking it was.
It wasn't all that. It was actually a horrible thing. So anyways, I hope y'all enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. Please like, share, and subscribe.